Hey, y'all. I'm Allison Asarch from Nashville, Tennessee. Hey, I'm Sean Fraser from the Ritzy Kids Hunters. This is Johnny from Rail Motor. Hey, it's Shane from Blind Season. Hey, it's Rob Stanier, and you can check out my music on all the streaming platforms. Check out my latest music on all the streaming sites. Check out my debut album on all streaming platforms. Check out our new debut album. Check us out on Spotify and Apple Music. And you're listening to our friends, Braggy and Curly. My favorite bands from Australia. My two favorite podcasters, Braggy and Curly. Braggy and Curly. On the Unfiltered. Unfiltered. And undiscovered, and undiscovered podcast. podcast. Hey there, everyone, and welcome to episode 117 of the Unfiltered and Undiscovered Podcast. We've got an exceptionally special guest with us tonight, but um, and only one panel member again. We've got Braggy down there in Adelaide, but we do want to send a big shout out to Rossi. I know he's up in the ho- at the hospital with his mum, hmm. um, and uh, we just want to send all our thoughts and best wishes and uh i hope that uh everything works out as as best it possibly can so yeah. rossi our thoughts are certainly with you while you're going through these stressful times but braggy yes, what really. what's happening i noticed um we've got some afl finals kicking off this uh, weekend i think and um and then nrl aren't, isn't that too far away so had melbourne did melbourne make it melbourne are there mate that's my team as you can see over there, I only, I only go for them because I go for Norwood because same colours as people on the podcast will know. Yeah, they finished fourth, so we get two bites of the cherry. We're coming yeah. up against Collingwood. There's probably going to be 80,000 at the wow. MCG on Thursday night, I would think. So I'm looking forward to that. So and I'm looking forward to when the finals come. It always means I'm starting to come into summer, so I'm looking forward to that too. Yeah, yeah I bet you are. <laughs> wearing this beanie. <laughs> so, so David, do you have an AFL team at all? Or yeah, well, I I went to uh, a boarding school for most of my life down in Victoria at Sale in Gippsland, and uh, one of the reasons we went down there is my parents uh, became very good friends with some uh, people who lived down near Lake Entrance, and uh, my adopted grandfather played uh, a sort of second division for Richmond, so I was drafted in as a Richmond supporter. <laughs> that was pretty good in those days. Uh, that was the Hellison days of Francis Burke and, you know, uh, Sheedy and Bartlett. and uh, Oh, winning. yeah, the flying yeah. doormat, Bartlett, yes. It was, it was fantastic. And then so I've, I've, so I've stuck with the uh, I've stuck with the Tigers, uh, played AFL. That's when I got my first broken nose. You can <laughs> genetically. I got it uh, th- three broken noses, one in AFL yeah. and two in rugby union when I moved up to Sydney later on in life. Wow. wow. Okay. It's funny with AFL, Connor, your team gets forced on you, doesn't it, most of the time? Oh, you don't have a choice. You just talk, no, you are going for Richmond. Joe Tiger, yeah. That's it, um, yeah. I'm six wow. years old. Yeah, I'm well, I've lived <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, We had a little renaissance there a couple of years ago, finally, which was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to write the Tigers. I don't mind the Tigers. I like yeah. the Tigers. And uh, the Lions have set themselves up well. So two home um, finals, if need be, and uh, the only mm-hmm. game they get to play away if they make the grand final will be at the G. So the Lions, not that they looked real impressive last week, I must say, but uh, it's finals. It's a whole new ball game, as they say. So, Yeah, anything can happen. In fact, uh Next week, I fly out on uh, Wednesday <laughs> week to France for the Rugby World Cup for six weeks. Oh. I'm, a big, I'm a big rugby union fan now, a long-term sufferer. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, this will be my fourth World Cup that I've been to. Yeah, oh. been to France before, been to England. And uh, actually, when they had the World Cup last year in Australia, I actually was one of the um, field doctors at the games. We had games up here on the central coast where I live. Oh. And I was one of the, because uh, I'm an emergency medicine specialist, that's what I did. Yep. So I was actually got to uh, go in and sit with the players' box and be there. So that was pretty exciting. So just for a front, yeah. front seat to watching them. So, Dave, uh, then are we going to be in for more pain or is there going to be some <laughs> miraculous, miraculous? Well, uh, I think- I'm I'm always, I'm always an optimist. I'm always an optimist, and uh, you know, I mean, look, it, it, he's made it pretty clear. He's decided to just build a team for the future, and we're not going to make the finals. None of it. We didn't even expect to. But 
to be fair, we weren't really going anywhere. You know, we were sort of at that stage where we, we had good players, but, you know, the Michael Hoopers and Quaid and mm. all those guys, but we still weren't getting the results. So mm. I think sort of thought, look, short-term gain, long-term gain, and I think we'll get to the through the quarters, but I don't think after that. And I'm in, in, you know, you I never know. We're a bit of a dark horse. Yeah, you know? I mean, we got we got, we're as low as we can kind of right. go, I guess. Hopefully, there's nothing to lose. So sometimes that exactly. uh, yeah. just got to go for it. You know, play play without fear and just just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, before we turn this podcast into a rugby union podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a little bit of news there, Braggy, don't you? We've got... Uh, yes, a good friend of the podcast, one of the first people we ever had on, Sean Fraser from the Ritzy Kids, tied the knot on the weekend. Yeah. So, congratulations, congratulations Sean. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the loveliest guys you ever want to meet, and his band's killing it at the moment as well in Sydney. So, Yeah, but always good to see. So congrats, Sean, and uh, I hope the honeymoon's going well. So... And let's uh, now officially welcome our guest. We've got uh, David Kirkpatrick with us, joining us. He's from Two Tone Pony. Now, the interesting thing here, Braggy, is yes. that when I was talking to our country music correspondent three weeks ago when <laughs> we started setting up David's yeah. interview, yep. uh, I, I, I talked to Big Stu and I said, Stewie, I've got David Kirkpatrick coming on from Two Tone Pony, and he said, Kirkpatrick, hmm, I wonder if he's the related to Slim Dusty. And at that stage, I had no idea, no idea. And I said, well, I'll have to find out. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, Braggy. What's the question? Well, I normally, yeah, I normally, I, I mean, I normally ask Dave how people, how how they get into music, you know, whether their parents are into music or stuff. So I'm just going to leave, forget that one. Yeah. But I, what I, what I, but the question I really want to know from you is that did you? I know you've had another career. We want, I really want to talk about that. Um, did did you while you were doing this other career in the in the medical field, did you want to play music or was it something that when you retired you just went, what am I going to do now? Oh, I know something that's in my blood. Yeah. No, I, I've always played music. Um, I've loved okay. music and I've always been in bands. Um, uh, my first band I was in was it started in year 11 when I was at school. By well, that stage, I was in school at Sydney. Hmm. And uh, the mate that I started that band with, uh, we both continued right through university. We played in bands and we were a sort of a, a rock band, cover band. And we played all the uh, western suburb pubs in the pretty rough areas. We had a residency at Greystains Hotel, which was a well-known uh, Bandidos and Comanches <laughs> headquarters. Um, in fact, there was another one where they used to have an open mic night, and I can't remember if he was the head of the Comanches or the Bandidos, but, and then we had to be the backing band for the open mic, and every Friday whenever we did it, this guy would get up and sing oh. Bob Dylan songs and uh, we'd just play behind him. And surprisingly, he won every week too. So, <laughs> he, um, <laughs> but yes. I, so to answer your question a bit more, I did. I mean, uh, I went through medicine, finished with that band. I came up to the Central Coast up here in New South Wales, at Gosford Hospital, and uh, as an intern, Within six weeks, I had a band going of other interns and other doctors here. Awesome. And we played through that and then all through the rest of my time here, yeah, I played on the coast with a, an appropriately um, medically named band called The Rhythm Method. Um, oh. <laughs> so, uh, it didn't work because we used to get new members all the time. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so, we, uh, so I played in that band all the time. So uh, right up until, I, you say, I retired. 2018, and my yeah. daughter Hannah was getting married up here on the hinterland of the Central Coast. He said, Dad, would you put together a band for me? You know, do the house band. Yeah. Party. And said, I, I want a country rock band. And I said, Oh, great. Good. I'm just finishing work. I can concentrate on this. And we had such a great time that I said to the blokes who were playing with me, I said, I really want to continue this. But I don't want to be a cover band anymore. I want to try to write my own stuff for the first time. And uh, yeah, 
and that's really the challenge I put out to. There was another songwriter in the band, Ian Rhodes, and since then that's that's where we've gone in the last four years. Yeah, mm. so that just goes to show that, Curly, that doesn't matter where, you know, what you've got in your background or, you know, mm. who your parents are, you still got to <clears throat> pay your dues, like playing for yeah. Manchos or whatever. You've still got to, yeah, you know, you've still got to right. do the hard yards. You've got to uh, do the hard uh, yards, all right. That's uh, it. Yeah, and look, it, it's, I mean, obviously I, I just grew up in music. I was actually mm. born on the road. My parents were on tour. Uh, my mother was pregnant with me. Her mother had come up. Uh, she got to Rockhampton in Queensland and thought, no, nope, better not go on any further. So we stayed in Rockhampton. The show moved on to Cairns. Uh, a couple of days later, I was born in Rockhampton. Yeah. A week later, mum, I and my nan got on a train full of Italian cane cutters and went from uh, from the Rocky up to Cairns, and the next six and a half years I lived in a caravan. Yeah. Wow. Wow. The good news about that is that you are obviously born a Queenslander, Dave. So yes, yeah, that's the other thing we didn't <laughs> talk about state of origin, did we? But yeah. <laughs> well, we're all on the same boat there, Dave, because I was born in Townsville, so I know North Queensland very well, <laughs> and and Cairns. I lived in Cairns for a bit, so and I know. A lot of those Italian cane cutters. <laughs> yeah. So well. so around this moment, at, at about this time of the episode, I reckon our country music correspondent, Big Stew's, strutting around saying, I got it right. And yes, Stewie, yeah. <laughs> David is the son of Slim Dusty and Joy McKean. So... So he would be loving the fact that he he picked that. But well done, yes. <laughs> so so what brought you? Let Let's talk a little bit about the medicine career. What brought took you down that path? Why Why was that a vet, where you wanted to focus? And well, yeah, I actually always wanted to be a vet, and I actually did straight from school. I actually went into a year of vets vet science at Sydney Uni, and uh, then I was playing in a band. And so I made a career choice based on the fact that if I did vet, I thought well, I'd probably want to do large animal practice, go out to the country more, but I really want to continue playing in ba this band. So in band, so if I do medicine, I can probably stay more in a, in a uh, urban area, and I'll get more chance to play music. So actually, oh, music yeah. informed my choice of career in that sense. I mean, I thought, okay, I can go across and try medicine, and then I really liked it, and. Uh, and uh, found my way in it, and um, and again, met it. the band was instrumental in how I ended up in Gosford because we were playing three to four nights a week. You know, in my right. last couple of years, we we're getting quite successful, and I kept saying, oh, "I've got to stop. I've got to stop. I've got my final exams coming up. I've got to spend some time studying." Anyway, I stopped too late. Had to do supplementary exam for my final exam which meant I didn't get a choice of where I got sent as an intern. And so they said, we've just started sending interns up to Gosford Hospital. You're going. So I went. I said, right, I've been up here once in my life. And, yeah, that was it. Started at Gosford Hospital. It was a smaller hospital then. It was one of those places where everyone knew everyone, you know. Mm. Everyone went out, socialised, the, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the ambulance officers, the physios. Everyone got together. You know, one sort of band of people it was a really fantastic atmosphere and of course as i said we started a band up here within six weeks so we were doing house parties all the time and um i just loved the central coast and uh, of course I then met my wife jane in that end of that first mm -hmm. year and uh, we just stayed on the central coast lived here ever since is there anything you could take I just find it really interesting because most of the guys I play in the band with are far from being like doctors <laughs> in the way they <laughs> in the way they think. So I just wonder if there's anything you can take from your, you know, your training in the medical career into a band, into a band. So you must be a very organised band, I would think. Uh, you're right. We are a very organised band because, as yeah. I said, like I was talking about that I started my band with in year eleven. I, when I started this band, I did some demos and uh, he wasn't in that original house band and he does keyboards and Hammond organ and I wanted, I sent him down some demos and he loved it so he came up and joined it. So 
full circle for both of us. Now he's playing in the band and he 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 went off into career as a specialist dental surgeon, you know, doing implant surgery. <laughs> One of the first ones in the So yes, we we have a very organised band. I have my, <laughs> my brother-in-law Greg Richardson is the drummer. Uh, yep. We've never played together before this, and we always, you know, talked about music. Now Greg is uh, an audio engineer and was a studio manager for ABC and and CBS Radio in Sydney. That's handy. Uh, we've got our technical advisor there. You know, we've got. And then Graham Puglisi on bass and Ian Rhodes on uh, guitar and multiple instruments. And they're both on the Central Coast in bands with me. Mm. So yeah, we, we look, it, it's um, it, it's well known that, you know, the left, right side of the brain that there's a lot. No, it's not unusual for a lot of doctors to mm. be quite creative in being uh, in artists or musicians or writers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Art, well, art and science, which I'll put the medical fraternity in, is is very similar in terms of the use of the brain. I would think. Here's me talking to a doctor saying that. But that's what I would think. <laughs> You're absolutely right, because I, you know, as a, as a, I was a um, emergency medicine specialist, so I used to mm. run the emergency departments, and you know, it's people would be saying, oh, you know, this and that about a test. I say, but yeah, but what? Do you think what what's your gut feeling about the patient? Do you think that test really suits? What do you mm. think? Ah, yeah. Throw away everything that you've got here because of one test, and so there is an art to it. Like yes. it, yeah. I couldn't believe it today. I just came off the 18th hole at golf, right? Walking across the walking across the, the road back to the clubhouse. Yeah. Thinking, uh, it was I didn't have a bad day, so that was all right. And my wife was playing as well. She had just come off, and I see the ambulance over there, and she's standing beside the ambulance, beckoning me over. So anyway, so now the, oh shit, I haven't seen a patient for four years, you know. <laughs> anyway, it was all, all okay, but it all it all sort of comes back to you, and uh, it, it's amazing. You went over, and the paramedics are there, and they look up, and they go, "Oh hi, Dave, how are you?" Yeah, so, so that's <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, what have you been up to recently? So uh, we're in the back of the ambulance talking about my my band while I'm checking. <laughs> out awesome! Back, you know? Oh, that's cool, Braggy. The timer went off, so it's now it's time for Braggy's. Who am I? <laughs> Okay, part one. Part one. Okay. <laughs> I was born on May 6th, 1945, at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. My father, a medical technician, Dave, for the Ford yep. Motor Company, played several instruments, so I was exposed to music from an early age. I was also exposed to frequent arguments between my parents that disturbed the neighbourhood at night. In 1956, when I was 10, my father abandoned the family and moved to California. Consequently, my family soon lost our middle-class status and struggled financially. I attended Tappan Junior High School in Michigan, where I excelled at track and field and listened to my early musical inspirations like Little Richard and Elvis Presley. The first record I bought was Come Go With Me by the Dell Vikings. I arrived on the Detroit music scene in 1961, fronting a three-piece band called the Decibels. The Decibels recorded a demo of a song called The Lonely One at Del Shannon's studio. As well as it being my first original song, it was also my first song to be played on the radio, airing only once on the local radio station. I'm not giving much away in that first lot. No, that's no, the first one. Not. No, you're not. So, all right. 1945, Detroit. Okay. Um, David, where did the name Two Tone Pony come from? It actually came about, I had a rockabilly tune um, and I couldn't come up with a decent set of lyrics. So I spoke to Ian, and who's very good at knocking up lyrics, and he came up with this set of lyrics, which had Two-Tone Pony, uh, written about a woman in a car. And that's when I learned that a Two-Tone Pony is a late 60s, early 70s Ford Mustang convertible. So they were called... Pony cars, you know, because it's got the Mustang. Mm, yeah. They were the old muscle cars. 
And a two-tone pony, you know, some of them have a secondary you know, colour stripe down the side, so that becomes a two-tone pony. And mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. where it there you go. Here's me thinking it was like an Appaloosa horse or something. Well, that's right. That's that's immediately what I would think too. That's right. <laughs> and we had a name which we couldn't use because we realised other people were using it. We were searching for names for a band, and uh, mm. then yeah, so there it is, right in front of us, Two Tone Pony. Well, it's cool because oh, wow. it's a little bit rock and roll and it's a little bit country. Exactly, which is exactly what we are. We're a, yeah. little, bit, we're a little bit rock and roll. And uh, that, that we, we sort of run that whole spectrum, particularly when we do live shows. Uh, by the end of the night, we're pretty much a rock band, where at the beginning of the night, we're more a country band. Mm. So what were some of your influences as you were growing up um, musically? I mean... Obviously, right. your your dad would have had a, yeah. a major influence on, yeah. on your music was, uh, taste. That was just an unconscious influence in, in many ways. I mean, I just thought that's what everyone's parents did, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like this, you know, when you're, you're six and you just spent most of your childhood mm -hmm. beside the stage, very interesting. I grew up behind the footlights, as they say, so I was seeing what went on backstage all the time. Um and uh, so, yeah, I, I absorbed all of that country music, obviously, Dad, and, um, in, and I absorbed the, the, the artists that he was loving at that time, which was the New Americans, obviously Johnny Cash, Buck Owens, Merle Haggard. But then later on, he got right into the outlaw scene. You know, he loved Waylon Jennings and Willie yeah. um, and some of the really out there sort of guys. Big fan of Tom T. Hall. He and Tom T. Hall became very good friends because uh, they were both storytellers. Um, mm. And then, of course, I went to boarding school and then, you know, I was growing up in the in the rock era, you know, so I was obviously a, my earliest influences were obviously the, the Stones and the Beatles. Anne would bring my sister Anne, who's six years older than me, uh, on holidays and that would bring home the singles. I remember all the singles and EPs of the Beatles and the Stones and I was a big Monkees fan. And then later on, obviously, went into the more sort of Credence, Led Zeppelin. Of course, I went through a big heavy metal phase because I first took up drums in, in a band. Um, but I would say, and then later on when I was at uni, my sister Anne, who was really the forerunner of bringing country rock into mm. Australia, yes, so she exposed me to the to the country rock people like uh, Graham Parsons and Emmy Lou Harris and... Um, mm. Linda Ronstadt, who was country rock before she became a big pop star. And I would say those, my own real influences when I song write, it would be Neil Young would be one of my biggest heroes and Tom Petty and John Fogg. Yeah. Those, those are really my rock influences. On the countryside, mm. I really loved John Prine when I was growing up and that was my mother turned me on to John Prine. Um, because he's such a great songwriter. And then I really like sort of the, you know, the the old country people like Jason Isbell and the 400 unit, uh, drive-by truckers, band of heathens. They're sort of my influences now. And I think that's, I don't know, I just write. And then if I had to pick two Australian songwriters that I just think are this generation's, mm. you know, the the cream of the pot i mean it's paul kelly and dodd walker so you just look yeah. how they write songs and i mean their lyrics are just you know par excellence but they write a fantastic uh, melodies and great chord progressions well they write stories too too Dave, don't stories, they stories tell us which i guess i grew yeah. up with music that was always telling a story yeah and that's really how i approach music myself I, I it just happens i can't really sit down and write a song if it's not a story it doesn't have to be a you know like a, like a chronological story of someone although i've done that it can just be a story of feelings and and yeah. uh, situation but it's still it's still a story yeah mm. yeah the lyrics are a forefront in, in the in the song yeah and you mate 100 percent like you know paul kelly and don walker yeah two of my favorites as well Mm -hmm. I've always put. It could be wrong, and people might have put might shout me down. But I always put Paul Kelly as as the Australian's Bob Dylan for you know, just a great yeah. great songwriter. Yeah, he's Australia's poet. That's why I view. Oh him, yeah, so. for sure. For yeah, sure. No. But so Dave, 
with your with the background, with your background, obviously with your parents and stuff, what is there any one lesson that you learned from them? Like in the, all those years of growing up, do you think there's any one thing? Probably it's probably more than just one thing that you took. Well, the thing, no, look, the thing I, I learned about my parents because was um, it was having rock solid belief in what they were doing. You know, mm. are they. When they started, they were looked down upon as hillbillies. They were called hillbillies, you know. They, they were never taken seriously by the music industry, even when Slim was EMI's top-selling artist. He was mm. the – you talk to anyone from EMI. Yeah. He's the man who kept EMI Australia going. Mm. And even then, he wasn't given the same – you know, accordance as some new pop star they wanted to bring up. I mean, that all changed eventually mm. in the 70s. Mm. Um, but it, but he, he, he and Joy stayed true to their vision and mm. they kept going. They knew they had something good. They had belief in what they did and they were very quality conscious. They didn't, they didn't skimp. They always did everything to the best of their abilities. Mm. And that's what I took, I've always taken from them. If, if I, I've got to believe in what I'm doing and I've yes. got to be myself and not try and be someone else. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, very much so. Um, Braggy, part two. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm taking my notes here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when we left, he'd, he'd had his first band, the Decibels. Yeah. Oh, I've given it away that it's a heap. I mean, never mind. <laughs> I'm hopeless at this. After the, dec after the Decibels disbanded, I joined the Town Criers, a four-piece band with me on lead vocals. We covered songs like Louie Louie and began gaining a steady following. While gigging with the Town Criers, I met a man named Doug Brown, backed by a band called The Omens. They had a bigger following than the Town Criers, so I joined them. <laughs> it was with this group that I first appeared on an officially released recording, the 1965 single TGIF. While with the Omens, I met my longtime manager, Edward Punch Andrews. I began writing for other acts that Punch was managing. I was asked to write a song for another local band, The Underdogs, who recently had a hit with a song called Man in the Glass. I wrote a song called East Side Story, which ultimately proved to be a failure for The Underdogs. So I left The Omens and recorded it myself. It became my first big Detroit hit and led to a recording contract with Cameo Parkway Records. Disappointingly, Cameo Parkway folded, so I began searching for a new label. In the spring of 1968, I signed with major label Capital Records. My first single with Capital was the anti-war message, two plus two equals what? Which reflected a marked change in my political awareness. The single was again a hit in Detroit and hit number one on radio stations in New York and Florida, but went unnoticed almost everywhere else and failed to chart nationally in the US. The single did, however, make the Canadian national charts, peaking at number 79. The second single, Rambling Gambling Man, became my first national hit, peaking at number 17 and gave a young Glenn Fry his first studio gig singing back up and playing guitar on the song. Unfortunately, I was unable to follow up this success and my next two albums failed to chart and so led to my departure from Capitol Records in 1971. Mm. Tricky one, isn't it? You'll, um, you'll get it after the next, or halfway through the next one. Yeah. Okay. Can we have a stab? Yeah, go. <laughs> Bob Seger. Bam. Love it, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I love it when the guest gets it. <laughs> Bob Seger. Um, so I'm just going to finish it now, Curly. Yeah, right? yeah, go for it. What wow. gave away, Dave? Was it Glenn Frey? Glenn Frey. Yeah. I mean, I knew because I was trying to see which way we were going, we soul or we whatever, but getting to that time. Yeah. And then, yeah, when Glenn Frey, I thought, oh, Detroit, Michigan, that's <laughs> that. So, yeah, so, so, so he got the ask from Capitol Records. Undeterred, yeah. I continued to write and tour, playing with many musicians who went on to bigger and better things. In 73, I released the album Back in 72, which included the songs Turn the Page that became a hit for John English in Australia. Yeah. And Rosalie, which became a hit for Thin Lizzy in England. I didn't know he wrote Rosalie. Yeah. 
but the album still only managed to reach 188 on the US charts. In 74, I put together what would become my most renowned backing band and returned to Capitol Records, releasing the album Beautiful Loser. The single Cat Man Do was featured in the 1985 movie Mask, starring Sher. <clears throat> then in 76, I finally achieved my commercial breakthrough, recording the album Night Moves, with the title track reaching number four in the Billboard pop charts. Known for my great live performances with the Silver Bullet Band and for mega hits, old time mm. rock and roll, Hollywood Nights, and Heartache Tonight, which I co wrote with Glenn Frey for the Eagles, which I didn't know either. Yeah, wow. Excellent. Excellent. That's, um, I would have got it with those last two or three Night clues. Moves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so David, let's talk about the reason why you're here. You've got you've got some recorded music out there. So uh, is, is this the first time you've actually recorded music and had it available? Absolutely. That's right. This is our the first time I you know, I, I had recorded songs as as a vocalist in the past on on albums with Slim and as a Slim Dusty family, a couple of albums. Uh, but yeah, obviously this this was music that I've written, our band. We went into the studio uh, end of last year, so we were recording. Mute with putting, we've got a couple of singles out. One with Justin, we've got another one coming out in um, about a couple of weeks' time. So this is, and then we've only just come back out of the studio again uh, with the same up here on the Central Coast. Rob McCormack, who's a well-renowned country music producer, singer, songwriter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, musician par excellence. And um, so we now have our album. We've got to come back when I get back from the Rugby World Cup and uh, finish off some vocals and, uh, and mixing it. And we will be releasing and probably one or two more singles over Christmas into the middle of next year. And then we'll put the album out at probably midway through the year. And yeah. So you're going to do it the old. We talk about this every week with the guests we have on because a lot of the younger guests will just put out one song, one song, one song, one song, one song. <laughs> but you'll kind of do it the old way. We'll give you a few singles and then we'll put the whole album out. Yeah, well, we just want to get out, get the stuff out, you know. I mean, yeah. keep going, yes, that's what we've got to do. You know, you can't, you don't put albums out. You just drip out some, and then you put your album out. So if you want to get, you know, mm. Mm. that's you know, well, it's all about us getting people. Hearing it. I mean, I, what our aim is is for people to hear our stuff and to like it. But we are, we do have a concept of putting a good album out, having a body of work that shows people more than just what one single does. And if they listen yes. to that, they'll see there's a whole gamut of what we do from acoustic right through mm. to full on electric. So yeah. um, we're very excited about getting those sort of, you know, album tracks are different to single tracks. And we really do have some album tracks that we think people are going to love but they're not mm. the track that you're going to put out as a single they're the ones that actually go really well when we play live you know yes. there's tracks that people love um that's uh that's what i'm really looking forward to and, and and getting hopefully then that leads us to getting a few more gigs next year and some of those you know festivals which is what we're aiming for yeah absolutely. yeah so well you put, i really you, love stormy weather dave i love the clip yes i love that, the film clip that was uh, that's just up here on the the hinterland from the central coast. A little place called Mangrove Mountain. So there's a whole community up there. They're all market gardeners, and yeah. that's there's this bloke up there, Ryan, who was a guy in the ticket box in the uh, in the uh, video. Yeah, and he he was born and bred up there, and he get he puts on concerts to keep all these local old community halls going. So this beautiful, you know, beautiful wooden high ceilings, great acoustics. Yeah. And we'd actually done a gig up there for him, a benefit gig. And I was thinking of stormy weather and, you know, we need something, bit bit of colour, what would happen? It's an upbeat song. It's a dance song. Mm. <laughs> and it goes back again to my daughter's <clears throat> wedding because when the, the wedding, my wife, Jane, said to me, I want to be able to dance better. So we went and took rock and roll dance lessons, right? Yeah. Um, not that it made me a better dancer, unfortunately. That, that was my next question. You just stole my next question. That's right. That's right. And so I'm thinking, I know if we're up on the stage looking down, I said, oh, wouldn't it be cool? Because I knew the people at this, some of the people there were competition dancers. So I rang up Rena from the dance studio and said, do you reckon you know, there'd be some couples who'd be interested? Well, we had... They're all interested. So we got, mm. you know, we had eight couples. They came up in all the gear. 
they even two of them turned up in in beautiful vintage hot rods which is one of the ones you see them driving start. yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, it was really fun a really fun day yeah, and yeah. it works well with the song because the song's got a little bit of rock and roll to it as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's got a rock and roll, rockabilly type yeah. beat. So I want the yeah. you know, watch it with all that sort of gear because that's exactly the sort of you know the, you you just do what you guys mm. do, and it's yeah. going to look great. <laughs> We won't care about the stormy weather Cause we're gonna make our own sunshine Everything about the world is feeling fine You and me could be good together We don't care about the stormy weather It doesn't matter to us no more It doesn't matter if the sky's not blue Everything's fine as long as I'm with you You and me could be good together We won't care about the stormy weather So tell me about the songwriting process of that song because and I'll give you some background to the question because this morning I was playing it for my wife and I'd, I'd made mention that this is uh, Two Tone Pony's song, Stormy Weather, and I believe it's written about your partnership or your relationship. And my wife looked at me and she said, don't you even think about writing a song called Stormy Weather about our relationship? <laughs> so... <laughs> So tell me about how, how the song came to be and what it's all about. Well, yeah, that's right. I, I, <laughs> it was a. I always wanted to write a song, you know, obviously for my wife and, and us. And uh, I've written other songs, but I thought yeah, it. I can't. I had the. I had the the sound of the guitar, the music. I was playing around with with um, uh, tunings, and um, Neil Young uses this tuning a lot on a few of his songs where he. D tunes the bottom E and the top E down to D. Yes. So it gives that ringing drone. It's called double D drop tuning. So I was yeah. I thought, oh, I'm trying this. It's nice. And I came up with a, a chord pattern and then just started humming away and getting an idea for a melody. Um, and I don't know. This is what often happens with me. I, 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 I'm just there playing and a line or two just pops into my head. And that's those opening lines of you and I could be good together. You know, we don't care about the stormy weather. That that was it. It started, and I now thought, ah, oh, how can we do it? So, it, so I built the song around the fact that you know, if you're lucky enough, like I am, to have found a life partner that you, we're still together after forty odd years, and you're going to face stormy weather. You know, all relationships mm. have up and downs, but it's mm. not just about the relationship. It's about life's going to throw mm. you, know, you life throws stuff at you, yeah, all the time, and you're going to face that a lot better if you've got someone beside you who you're both, you know, in it together and trusting each other and you're supporting each other. So that was what it was all about. Um, but mind you, I got the same look when I came to Jane and said, oh, I've written a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. it's stormy weather. Wow. And I got exactly the same. What? <laughs> I had to do a lot of rapid explanation, you know. That's great. Uh, That's great. <laughs> Yeah. When's it? When's your? When's your writing time? Well, I ask this question a lot too, Dave. Do you? Is there any particular time? Like for me, it's always the mornings. I always feel much more focused in the mornings. Um, it, it can be 
anywhere? Any time, really. Okay. It's a, I, I te it tends to happen in bursts. It depends on what's happening in my life, how much time I've got, whether I'm stressed with other things. I need to be a bit relaxed. Although yes. sometimes I do. I mean, I'm always just, I've got a little music room downstairs and I'm always just drop in there and I'll pick up a guitar. And actually that's my way of relaxing if I am stressed. Mm, mm. Um, uh, look, it, it, I've written songs at 10 o'clock in the morning. I've written songs at 10 o'clock at night. It, it's, I don't have a particular time. Although when I go back to finish off the songs, that would usually be during the day. Because I you know, I often get about 75% comes to me pretty quickly. Yes. I Particularly for the lyrics, I've got to go back and work on those because yeah. I don't want to just have a, a last throwaway verse. I really want it to all gel and hold together. Um, and I'll often go back and rewrite and I'll put a demo down for the band and then I'll often, oh, no, I'll chop a verse out here and I'll put a, I'll change those words. Sometimes I swelch it around because when I play it to them, I said, oh, it actually, narrative runs better if I'd moved verse three to two, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah. I'm very lucky to have a fairly big guitar collection. So sometimes that's what triggers me. I, I haven't picked that guitar up in a while. And I just start playing, oh, I love the sound of this. Why haven't I played it for a while? And then a chord progression or a, or a sound or a riff and an idea comes to me because of that. Yeah. I've, I've written songs walking along the beach, bushwalking, um, the kayaking, um, you know, it's all the words. I've often started on something and then yeah. I'm out. I, it, I, if I'm out and it's really nice and quiet, even yeah. driving down the freeway to Sydney, if I don't have any music going, I've got an idea in my head, I turn all music off so I'm not distracted and I just yeah. think of my own song. And I've often I've finished off several songs where I've had to pull off the freeway, put the voice memo on and get it down uh, before I forget it. Yeah. 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 Our, last, our last guest, David, Sammy Palinkas, actually finished a song in the golf buggy on the golf course. Yeah. Uh, so have you ever written a, finished a song on the golf course or started a song? No, I'm far too stressed on the golf course. No, but you know, <laughs> you know what's interesting though is that I think I think movement has a lot to do it to do with it. That I think about it. I think moving because the song does move. You know, there's a rhythm obviously to it. I think I know. Mm. I find myself if I'm walking, that's I get the, again that rhythm, and I can I can hear the words come or whatever the music goes. Yeah, it's the same so, whether you're driving or or you know or in yeah. the golf cart. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about the movement, but maybe that's it because, yeah. It, it, I and you grew up on the road, Dave, so. Well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in cars, you know, I crossed the Nullarbor about, I think, three times before oh. I was, you know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. incredible. So you do have another song out. It's called A Life World Lived. So this was that's the right. first release. <laughs> She's 84 She's done it all and seen a whole lot more All part of a life well lived I help her carry in her groceries We sit and talk over cups of tea All about a life well lived We sit and watch the sun go down Here in her hometown This is the place she wants to be With her friends and family She got married back in 46 After the war it wasn't bliss At the start of a life well lived She wasn't rich, but never poor Her home always had an open door Hey, welcome to a life well lived uh, Life Well Lived was the first release um, Stormy Weather, which is what, about five weeks ago? And then 
we have a song called The Cost of Love coming out on September the 15th, which is... Oh, I like the sound of that. Yeah, it's coming. And it, it was really interesting, actually, because I had a very good mate of mine that I, I worked with. Um, he was mm. an emergency... In fact, he, there were two... He and I were the first two emergency medicine specialists on the Central Coast. Mm. And we worked to set up the system and he unfortunately got a, a brain cancer and he died. And um, we, my wife's a nurse and we were both there. We, we were, used to come into the house and help mm. um, look after him and we're very close to his wife and his, and his kids. And, and that's where this idea came up from, the, the, the cost of love. And believe it or not, then Queen Elizabeth said the same thing after her husband died. Yeah. The cost of love is grief. Because you love someone deeply, and whether you lose them because you break up or you lose it because they die, mm. if you're going to have that amazing mm. feeling of love, the cost of that is going to be grief at some time. Wow. And uh, yeah. and that's what I wrote the song about. But you know, at the end of it, um, it's a hopeful song. That at the end, you know, one day you're going to pass through. You'll see that you know things. Are, you're in a different space, and you, you'll you'll move on, which is what anyone would think their partner would want them mm. to do. They didn't want you just staying in the past always, you yeah. know. Yeah, um, you're better for having love than for not having loved at all. Exactly. I mean, that's it. You know, it, it's so true, isn't it? I mean, if you mm. don't, if you don't, you know, if you haven't experienced intense emotions, you're missing out on it. But the intense mm. emotions are both good emotions and then you're going to have the bad emotions. Yeah. And that's just life and that's just part of it and uh, you just got to do it. But this one actually, because this is electric song, this is what I wrote on my my old rockabilly. I've got a beautiful old rockabilly Gresh, you know, like the Dwayne Eddy sort of style. Yeah. And i got this beautiful twangy, jangly sound and my mate Glenn on Hammond organ um, and it's very much more a sort of a, a pop country, almost Roy Orbison style in a way, you know, but uh, mm. it, it shows a different side to what we had put out the, these last two, which are far more acoustic based sort of songs. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's why I love an album. I mean, I'm because I'm, yes. I'm, I guess I'm old as well, old school as well, but I love, I love listening to the whole gambit yeah. of what, you know, as a bigger piece of art. It's like a, it's like a mural to me. I can look at the different parts and rather than just one, yeah, time, you know? just picking things out. I mean, um, mm. I mean, I think we're all the same. We we grew up in that area where, era when albums were an event. You yeah, know? yeah. You, you waited and you got that album. You you looked over the LP cover. You read everything on the back. I was a complete. I still do that. <laughs> you know, I still do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you do the songwriters were. You know, all these yeah. people are always saying to me how oh when you tell them that you know. The monkeys, for example, you know Neil Diamond wrote this, and Harry yeah. Wilson. But they, they, oh, did they? Did they write that? Those? I said, yeah, I knew all that. I knew all that when I was eight. You know, so yeah, from reading the back of albums, yeah, and then you read, oh, that guy. I've seen him on the back of another album. That guy that's played the brass on, on this, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, and also it leads you on to other things. Yeah, correct. Look, it's great. Music is so available. You can hear different things, but uh, the. You know, artists used to put a lot of work into conceiving an album, the track listing. Yeah. If you're not a musician or real an audiophile, you don't realise how much effort people put in. They don't just say, oh, there's 12 songs, yeah, put them down. They think of everything that leads into that song. And if you think back on your favourite albums, if you say this song, you can tell on a Beatles album, what would the next song is? Or what yes. Yeah, song yeah. Is. yeah. It doesn't have to be just Beatles. Any any really good album that you love, yeah. you know the song comes next. Yeah, next yeah. It, it flows. It, it flows. Fun. And and often we'll, you know, we had Braggy dissect uh, a Bruce Springsteen album and the stories that the the album takes you through, the journey of the stories, yeah. it was just amazing. So, yeah. and yeah. there's you know, another so you know, standout artist of his generation because it's the same thing. He writes he wrote stories about his life in New mm -hmm. Jersey, the streets, the houses, the people. Yeah. And and it is say it actually flows through all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. So a couple of things to look forward to then. We've got the the new song coming out and then that's leading into an album. So that's pretty right. exciting. Yeah. So and we're, we're hoping that next year 
um, that leads us into a couple of the, you know, particularly country music festivals. There's a hell of a lot of them around the, around Australia. So we'd like to get our toe into a few of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, there's a lot more little festivals now too, isn't there? There is. It's great. You know, it's just popping up everywhere, you know, in Texas, Queensland's got a new one. Here on the Central Coast, there's quite a few popping up. Uh, mm. Up and down the coast, down in Tassie, you know, all those sort of places. It, it, people are really enjoying getting back to, to festivals and they really yeah. like local ones too. Yes. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned festivals. I was talking to my good friend Roy Casina down there in um, Victoria. It was his birthday today. So, of course, we conversing through Facebook. Yeah. He's back playing music, which is a real positive in my eyes. And he's playing the Patchy Wallach Music <laughs> Festival. And he... And he said it's possibly the cheapest in the world at fifty bucks a ticket. So, and it actually doesn't look too bad. It's uh, the Patcha Wallach Music Festival. Um, I'm presuming that's near a place called Patchy Wallach. So, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, but, but yeah, it looks pretty cool. It's just fifty bucks a ticket. It's out in the country <laughs> somewhere, and it's just awesome. So, October twentieth to the twenty second. So. For any location, I better look at location. The festival takes place in the main street of Patchy Wallach, based around the Patchy Wallach wow. Hotel. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to look it up. I'm right. going to have to look that up too. I've got no idea where that is. That night, that's amazing. What yeah. a country yeah. we live in, where you could just uh, there's a festival somewhere we don't know where it is. No yeah. Idea. yeah, excellent. So, David, we um, will include your music in the unfiltered and undiscovered playlist that we have on spotify um we're about that 16 hour mark so every music we talk about on the show goes into that playlist so hopefully that'll pick you um up a one or two new followers if you do like the music which um we edit into the show please go and follow the boys that two-tone i should oh, boys i'll call them boys the yeah, two-tone pony band <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and um, how are you finding Facebook? So, uh, well, I've I've had to delve into it after years of of my you know poo pooing my wife using Facebook, and now she says, oh, now I can't get you off it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we run the band Facebook and the band Instagram, and we TikTok? have TikTok. You got TikTok, Dave? No, we haven't gone to TikTok. I haven't gone to TikTok. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. My daughter warned me off TikTok, so don't do TikTok, please. Fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, we're on those and we've got our own website. We've got our own YouTube channel. So we're, we, we, we're, we're doing it. We're getting it out there. We're being part of it. We're trying to keep yeah. up. People know. Yeah, no, let's go. Ahead. I checked out the YouTube channel today and I'll, mm. um, it's funny you said um, I was just I was looking at all your guitars. That Every time yeah. I saw you play, you had a couple of nice acoustics. So when you said <laughs> you've got an extensive guitar collection, I thought, ah, there we go. So, yeah. And uh, if, if Rossi was here, he would have he would have picked up on that as well because he actually he actually works for Fender, Rossi. So oh, does it? Yes. Well, I got a couple yeah. of nice Fenders. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice yeah. Tele, nice sixty-seven Tele special. Beautiful one ones. Beautiful guitar. Yeah. Yeah, and I know Rossi was looking forward to the interview today with you. He sent us a message earlier in the day. He said a lot of my very good mates toured with Slim in the eighties. They yeah. loved him, and he was very good to them. And Rossi's uh, the the celebrity roadie. He roadied with so many of right. the Aussie independent bands of that era. But of course, he's got this wide widespread knowledge and understanding of the music industry. So it's um, he always looks at it from that road uh, crew perspective, and uh, loves artists that look after their road crew. So. Yeah, well, it's, it's very important, isn't it? So, I mean, we, you, you know you should learn very quickly that it, you're in the hands of the road crew. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm, very much so. So, David, I'll make sure all your links are in the show notes. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show to, um, this evening. And as I've uh, I, as I've said before, if anyone loves the music that uh, Two-Tone Pony are putting out, 
it's uh, I, I really enjoy Stormy Weather. You'll love the film clip. There's a lot of nostalgia and just a lot of fun in that film clip. So make sure you get out there and you follow them and you listen to their music. And as per always, if you've enjoyed the episode, please like and subscribe. Leave a review. We're on YouTube. Facebook and TikTok. We've also got the website at unfilteredandundiscovered.com. Um, all of our music we talk about, we put into our playlist on Spotify and lyrics from that playlist this week comes from the very own host of this show, Tave Bragg. Oh, no. It's a life rail motor and it's really fitting based on what we've been talking about. And the lyrics are, it's a life, it's the only one You've got to learn how to live, learn how to have a little fun. It's a life and it's so small. You've got to figure out how the hell we're going to do it all. Great lyrics, great band, Thank Ralph you, Miller. <laughs> Thanks so much, David, for, for sharing the show cool. with us. And um, to everyone else, we will see you all again next week. Bye for now. Thanks very much, guys. Go on, yeah. Sing me.